So let's get started. Welcome everybody to the Fraser Valley Conservancy's Nature Stewardship School. Today we are presenting a look from past to present with a special feature on working with nature to curb climate change. Please keep yourself muted and keep your video off. This session is being recorded. So before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the Stalo and the Coast Salish people have stewarded the Fraser Valley since time immemorial. At Nature Stewardship School, we come together to learn how we can help to care for this land while recognizing our need for respectful reconciliation. So please take a moment to reflect on the land you stand on today as you watch this webinar. So for those of you who just joined us, welcome. Please keep yourself muted and keep your video off. This is being recorded. If you have any questions, feel free to type them in the chat box and we will address them. For now, I'm gonna get you to meet your hosts. I'm Alicia Switzer. I'm a biologist here at the Fraser Valley Conservancy. I'm moderating, getting you started and wrapping you up at the end. But we have a very special guest speaker, Dr. Mike Pearson. He's a biologist with Pearson Ecological. He's going to be taking you through our first bit of our presentation. And then that'll be followed by Laura Brody, who's our close to home program coordinator here at the Fraser Valley Conservancy. And she'll take you through the second bit. Then it is a wrap up with me again. So for those of you who haven't interacted with the Fraser Valley Conservancy before. Who is the Fraser Valley Conservancy? We are the Fraser Valley's local charitable land trust since 1998. We protect and enhance natural areas in the Fraser Valley that benefit native species, ecosystems, and local communities. Our activities focus on stewardship and land securement, and we get up to a whole bunch of fun things. You can find out more about us on our website, find us on Instagram, and Facebook. Our workshop agenda, like I said, Mike Pearson is presenting on the Stalo, A River Through Time. It's gonna be a very interesting presentation, followed by Laura looking at Fraser Valley Climate Stewardship. We'll have a question and answer period for both of them together at the end. So get those questions typed in the chat, keep yourself muted and your video off, and then we can have a fantastic Q&A session a little bit later on. Then I'll take you through a wrap up and that's it for the night. Well, before going to the wrap up, we're gonna need some presentations. So I am going to pass this on to Mike. So Mike, if you could share your screen and get yourself started, we'll be happy to have you speak. Thank you. Oh, one thing I forgot to mention, uh, Mike is joining us uh, with a satellite connection and there may be a couple of technical glitches that happen. If there is a pause, I'm going to be telling Mike that something may have been missed, asking him to step in, but hopefully all the stars align and the satellites too, and we get a nice, nice clear connection from Mike. So here's hoping. Thanks, Mike. Hey, can everyone, can you see that? Yep, looks good. Okay. Thank you all for joining us tonight. It's uh, a real pleasure to be able to, to give this talk. So the state of the, the title is Stalo, A River Through Time. Stalo being the Halkamalum name for the, uh, for the Fraser River. We are indeed on the unceded territory of the Stalo and Coast Salus people. And I wanted to take a minute and just think about that word unseated, which kind of legalistic, uh, maybe a bit euphemistic now, and emphasize to ourselves what it actually means, which is that the territory was stolen from the Stalo Coast Salish people. And I think that's particularly important to acknowledge with, with tonight's topic, because the river, is, nothing is more important than the river in those cultures. An overview of the 
to talk some deep history way back in time and talk about the ecosystem and some habitat loss and restoration briefly. So we'll start with some deep history. And 14 and a half thousand years ago, 145 centuries, does sound like deep history, but in the terms of the history of the so this is what it looked like 14 and a half thousand years ago. And this is a map from a fantastic book, one of my primary references for many years of the uh, Stalo Coast Salish Historical Atlas. And you can see sort of in the shadows on this picture, Vancouver being where my cursor is now, the Fraser River here, Harrison Lake up this way, Richmond and Delta still part of the ocean. A thousand years later, uh, or several thousand years later, most of the ice was gone. There was still a big block of it in the central Fraser Valley, but the surrounding lands and waters would have been full of fish and wildlife and people. Just last week, it was uh, a study was um, announced where they'd found um, evidence 18,000 years ago in the middle of the ice age of uh, of people on Haida Gwaii. So if they were there 18,000 years ago, they certainly would have been here at this time. Also around 11,000 years ago, a massive flood, a study published last year, that uh, the, as the glaciers retreated, it held back a huge lake centered around Prince George. Well, this lake was, uh, they estimate 250 meters deep and when the ice dam let go and it came ripping down the Fraser River and into the Fraser Valley, the volume was several hundred cubic kilometers of water. Unimaginable. They found it actually. The first, the first evidence of it was unexplained sort of mud and sediment washed up on the east coast of Vancouver Island. It took it that far. By 10,000 years ago, Again, largely ice-free, still a little bit of a block of ice, or a huge block of ice, really, that uh, later you will notice is in the location of Sumas Lake. That's what Sumas Lake actually left from that. And then 220 years ago, the valley was Sumas Lake there, and an astonishing number of indigenous communities up and centered on the Fraser River. So I'm going to talk about three reaches tonight. Um, the canyon, very briefly, and the gravel reach extending from Hope to Mission, um, the characterized by islands and bars, and then the tidal reach of the estuary from Mission to the ocean. So the canyon is as described. It's steep-walled, um, narrow, the river's deep and fast. And when the water is high during freshet, it comes up a lot. The top left picture I took from the tree line, so I'm meters, probably 10 meters above the water. This, uh, these pictures were taken in the fall at quite low water. And in the bottom right, the, the tributaries that come in here, I think this is Texas Creek, are steep, boulder strewn, cold, and, and, once, and they're only fish accessible usually before the terrain's too steep. That changes dramatically downstream of Hope. The river widens out, loses its energy, and as it loses that energy, it drops gravel. And so this section of stream is characterized by just a maze of islands and bars. And the main stem itself is still largely intact structurally. And this complex, this dynamic habitat is a biodiversity hotspot. And imagine looking at that, no matter what the water level, there is going to be fast water and slow water and deep water and shallow water and a whole range of habitats. So the fish can move with the water levels to find the habitats they need. That's the, the secret of its productivity. Right down to microhabitats. Uh, this is from a PhD thesis at Laura Rempel in 2004. And she looked at um, the, the habitats on individual 
there. So you can see in the diagram all the little nooks and bays that are within them on the inside and on the outside with different currents. And each of these little micro habitats has different fish communities at different times of the year. Lots of juveniles, right? Um, are in these, these fairly protected areas. And during freshet in May and June, when the river comes up, the floodplain. This is a, a flooded cottonwood forest near Island 22, right, ac on, uh, right across from Shui Village. So the water is up probably a meter and a half in those cottonwood trunks. And this water is full of fish. Lots of fish spawn at that time. We found uh, um, in sampling this year, um, I had the privilege of uh, working with um, some fishers from Chiam and Samath and uh, Lakamal at high water. And we found fish in these tiny little eddies, whatever, in protected areas. Um, lots of Chinook mountain suckers in there. In the more flooded forest, it's full of um, hundreds of thousands of juvenile um, minnows, red sided shiners, pea mouth, that kind of thing and everything in between. So in the, during the flood, the fish move laterally, right? Because being in the center of the Fraser during freshet, I've heard a geomorphologist just describe as like being in the Sahara Desert in the middle of a sandstorm. You don't wanna be there. So they're moving into these marginal habitats that are a little more protected from current and from the sediment load. Then from Mission down to the the ocean is the estuary where tides rule. So in the top left, you can see low water, these extensive mud flats. This is Tilbury Slough down in Delta between Tilbury Island, a very, you know, covered in industry. And, uh, and this, this slough is, um, the parts of it that are still connected to the river are full of Chinook. Also down there, you can find is in the lower left, some, um, brackish water species like this flounder. So this is, it's hard to make out on the picture, but this is a flounder with you know, both, eye, the eye, both eyes on the same side of its head. Starry flounder, they're called. So the salmon in particular ride the tides. So they'll come in at, ride the tide in on high water. And then in these flooded marsh areas, which are full of algae and food and in, insects, will forage and then move back out as the tide ebbs. And they will, uh, that's, and the other thing that's happening here is that they're adjusting their physiology, their bodies to, for the move from fresh water to salt water. So in this whole section of the river, there's over 30 species of indigenous freshwater fish, more than about 27 in the gravel reach alone. That's more than any other stretch of river. 10 species of salmon. It again speaks to the, the productivity and the biodiversity values there. There's sturgeon, the largest freshwater fish in the world. It's an incredible picture taken by Fernando Lessa. You'll notice a number of photos on here are taken by him. He's a pro photographer that I work with. I really encourage you to visit his website. He's got a couple of books on the Fraser that are well worth uh, buying as well. So in addition to the sturgeon, these are there's the prickly sculpins. These are all saltwater species. So after glaciation, the only way back in, um, or one of the only ways back in is from the ocean. So many of our species are both saltwater and fresh. It's a lamprey in the lower left and the three-spined stickleback. There's also fish that can't come in through the ocean. So I talked about that ice dam breaking. Well, that occurred a few times, um, including the South Thompson River was a, a lake. That's what all those um, eroding sediment cliffs you see around Kamloops are, the old lake bottom. And that drained into the Columbia River. So when that ice dam broke and that water came into the Fraser Valley and another mass came with it. Northern pike minnows, leopard dace, large scale suckers, red side shine. And of course the salmon. The five species we think of salmon and two more, the steelhead and cutthroat trout that are really the very closely related, almost the same. 
So this brings us to our little poll, the one little poll we're going to run in this talk, and that is how many indigenous freshwater fish species are there in all of British Columbia? I've already told you how many in the lower Fraser Valley. And as another hint, we'll tell you that there are 124 in Ontario uh, with about the almost roughly the same land area. So I'll give you a few seconds. But I'm actually not going to tell you until the end because I'm going to explain at that point. So I think I will just continue now. Or actually, we'll go with the poll results first. Okay. So, Alicia, does, how should I announce this, or can people see the polls? People can see the results. They can see that 5% right. selected 66. 41% selected 175 and 55% selected 230. So you can close right. that box on your screen, Mike, so you don't have to look at it anymore. All right. Well, there we have our results. And we'll get to that at the end. And we all know, and I apologize for the graph, it's very interesting as I'll show you, but uh, it's about migration. We all know quite a bit, I think, about sort of the adult spawner migration where they come into the ocean up and uh, spawn in fresh water. This is the reverse. This is the juveniles heading for the ocean. And so I know it's hard to read, but it's a very simple graph. So on the uh, vertical axis, this is the fish length. Each dot is a fish. Um, and then it's the months from March to August across the x axis. So what it shows in each color. What's this showing is that in March and April, we have chum salmon and pink salmon that are quite small because it's early in the spring. They've just hatched out of the gravel and they're heading down and they catch them at the estuary. This data from Rain Coast and University of British Columbia was given to me by Dave Scott there. And in for about a one month period, in, <clears throat> excuse me, from mid April to mid May, the <clears throat> stream type Chinook come down. These are Chinook from all over the watershed that spend the, uh, a full winter in fresh water. So these are year old. That's why they're so much larger than all the rest of them. But you'll also notice these ocean type Chinook. So these are, are stocks of Chinook that do not spend a winter in fresh water, but meander their way to the ocean over the course of their first summer. And you see that they in do, indeed are meandering down. They're arriving all from early spring right until August. And they're getting bigger as time goes on as they're feeding, of course. And then the song is later in the summer, just after freshet in June and July. Now, the interesting thing about those Chinook arriving, the majority of them are from one population in the Harrison River, right from March through to July. And so let's talk about that stock, because it's incredible. Is it the largest stock of Chinook in the Fraser, perhaps the largest in the world? We're talking about 100 to 200,000 spawners producing 30 million fry annually, all in this four kilometer stretch. Now, get, grant you that river is 300 meters wide, but those fish create structures that can be seen from space. These ripples in here are not created by water. These are dunes, five meters high, 15 meters wide, 100 to 150 meters long. And they're created by lines of Chinook salmon year after year spawning through there. They don't get washed out because Harrison Lake immediately above the river is the big flood. So even in a flood like November, the Harrison River does not rage. So 30 million fish fry are not going to in that section of river. That's why they're ocean type. This is a large, so they, um, they rear all the way down to the, uh, to the estuary. And so what you find when you sample in the lower reaches of these creeks and wetlands you know, from May through to July is Chinook everywhere. 
you know, several kilometers up some of these streams here. Now this story that I've told you, I've uh, sort of cribbed from a, uh, an excellent video, an hour long by Matt Foy on the Harrison Chinook, which is well worth your time. A lot more information on this. He's also got one on um, the uh, Chilliwack Lake should be equally interesting. So I encourage you to watch those. You can find them on his channel on YouTube. And the other thing I would say about the Harrison Chinook is that it gives us some insight into restoration priorities because 100 to 200,000 fish sounds like a lot, but you know what? That's not what limits. The spawning area is not what's limiting this population. It's the rearing population. There is enough gravel up there, it's estimated, to support twice that many. So restoring these side channels, um, sloughs and all that is the biggest thing we can do for Chinook salmon in the river. And there's a lot to do because there's a lot of impacts in the river. This is a picture of Hurling Island, which uh, was bought and clear cut, um, a good part of it, which you can see, you know, some of the uh, um, more historic impacts of the railway and the highway in the south part of it. The province, I'm very thankful, turned down the proposal to build a bridge to it. Other impacts we see uh, bank hardening is rampant, sort of rip rap along the banks, which simplifies the shoreline. Gone are the overhanging vegetation and the uh, sort of nooks and crannies that the fish use, and you end up with a hard bank and higher water velocities, little habitat value. Clear cutting isn't the only reason we're losing the uh, um, island habitat or forested island habitat. The dikes are raising the water level. So in in the past, before the dikes, when the river spilled over into the floodplain, it would lose its energy at that point. As the dikes get higher, the river gets deeper during freshet, above what it would have been historically. And as it gets deeper, it has more power and more erosion power. So what's um, a UBC study found a number of years ago, looking at aerial photos, that although the total area of island had not really changed between 1928 in 2000, what we had was far more bare gravel bars and less forested islands. That's the legacy, one of the legacies of diking that we may not think about. Now about fragmentation. So this is uh, during freshet in the, the top picture. So high water and the gates into Mountain Slough are closed tight, so no fish can get in or out. And the lower one, Agassiz Slough, there are many of these top hinged floodgates. It's a cast iron gate that has, you know, can only opens an inch or two even with a fair amount of pressure from behind it. So it's pretty much a complete barrier to fish access. A, uh, a shout out to um, Watershed Watch Salmon Society who um, mapped in their connected water project all of the um, pumps and floodgates in, in 155 of them for, and I have the, the uh, privilege of working on a project that came out of that called Resilient Waters, where we're addressing, looking at addressing some of these to restore fish access. And that's happening, because I picked those two examples for a reason. They've both been replaced. That mountain slough floodgate and pump has been replaced with an, an additional floodgate and an Arche a fish-friendly Archimedes screw pump. And that on the bottom is the new Agassiz Slough floodgate. I haven't got a picture of it open. That's just after it was just put in, but it will be open almost all of the year, only closed during freshman. <clears throat> Behind the dikes too, there's issues. The water's warmer, has far less oxygen and a lot more introduced species. The lack of oxygen is rampant. I was just involved in a, we published a paper last year showing that um, fully, half or more of the uh, the stream area in 10 of this and 10 streams of you know, watersheds in the Fraser Valley are stressful or lethal to some on us during the summertime. That's due to a lack of riparian vegetation and shade combined with massive nutrient loading, mostly from agriculture. There are other sources, but 
agriculture is certainly the leading source. And I want to talk about two, sort of with the time left, of the biggest potential restoration sites in the Fraser Valley. One of them, Katesy Marsh, is, uh, would not take a lot. Some political will and uh, some engineering, and it could go. Sumas Lake, of course, is a different story. Um, it's been, we've all been thinking about it after the devastating floods of November. And we're certainly not ready for the restoration of the lake itself. But I put it there because I believe that in the long run, in the face of significant sea level rise and increased frequency of major storm events, that it is inevitable that eventually part or all of that lake is gonna to need to be restored because we won't be able to keep it dry. A little more detail on Katesy Marsh. This is 3,400 acres of marshland behind a dike. The only infrastructure in there are a road, besides the dike or the road on top of it, a boarded up canoe rental, and docks that are falling apart, sort of subject to a dispute between the province of BC and Katesy First Nation. And Teal Jones Forestry Company has a dock here that they use as a staging area for their operations at the north end of Pitt Lake. So if the dike were extended across the road at the division between the marsh and the farmland, all of that could be turned back to the tides. Big project. And you might say, well, how do we know it will work? We have a good indication because you'll notice on the sort of bottom left, it says golf course there. Well, that's just south of that same golf course is Addington Point, which was also completely diked off until 2004 when it was breached in three places, those green stars, and the tides were let back in. We've been sampling in there, and there are Chinook going right to the center of that marsh on every tide during the summer. And they may not all be Chinook from the Pitt River, because of course the Pitt River runs backwards with the tides. And that spit itself was built from Fraser River sediment being pushed up the Pitt River. So if we don't know, we will know soon from genetic samples, but I suspect that Fraser River fish use that habitat. Also interesting is unlike Katesy Marsh, the, there are very few invasive species in here. They just don't like the tides and the, those cold tides coming in twice a day. So pictures of Sumas Lake prior to it being drained. Massive lake, over 100 square kilometers at high water. So that's where it's sat. So there's Cultus Lake there, the Fraser River. This is Sumas Mountain right here. So this is what it was like originally, or the 220 years ago anyway. In 1875, settlers closed off a lot of the delta because this is fed by the Chilliwack River. So the lake was sort of the eastern part of that, the western part of that, sorry. So settlers closed off part of a good part of the delta, forcing all of the water into Sumas Lake to dry it out for farmland. And then in 1920, drained the lake itself. So that's what we, we have now, with the Vetter Canal running through the middle of it. Of course, the frailty of that system there once again, not for the first time, but probably most dramatically in November of this year, of 2021. And I mean, this picture, as pretty as it is, does show the extent of the devastation, all of those buildings and livelihoods in there, the Sumas River winding through the middle of it. But it also shows the shape of the lake. So to finish up, 95% of you were wrong. There are 66 fish species in British Columbia. 
very few. And the 230 I actually cribbed from the Tennessee River, which has only a little over a tenth of this land area of British Columbia. So that seems like an odd thing. It comes, the, uh, the reason for that, I think I froze again. The reason for that is the glaciations. So in the East, Ontario and Tennessee, glaciers came down, they just pushed down and all the fish just pushed down the Mississippi River. And as the ice retreated, they swam back up. No species really were lost during the glaciation. In contrast to out here, where all of our rivers enter the, or major river systems enter the ocean separately. So when they all, everything was wiped out by glaciation, as I said in the talk, very limited ways they can recolonize from the ocean or from these very temporary connections between major river systems. And that's why we have so few which I've always found very interesting. That's my talk. Um, so again, I'd to thank you for your time and these folks for their help. So thanks very much. Thank you, Mike. Next, we're gonna to transition to Laura. Don't forget everybody, uh, if you have questions about what you've heard from Mike, uh, don't forget you can pop them into the chat because we'll have a Q&A session uh, just after Laura's talk. So uh, get those questions ready and uh, see what questions you might have for Laura as well. And we'll see Mike again shortly for our Q&A. Now it's off to you, Laura. Hi everyone. Uh, hear me, see me. Yep. Uh, so I will be talking about know, knowing, stewarding, and protecting the landscape in the age of climate change. Again, my name is Laura Brody, and I'm the Close to Home Program Coordinator at Fraser Valley Conservancy. And as Mike was discussing the history of the Fraser Valley, I'm going to start to talk about looking to the future of the Fraser Valley. Um, so what are the biggest factors determining what the Fraser Valley will look like next? We have population growth, and this comes hand in hand with increased development. Um, and then on top of that, we have climate change. So particularly, I'll be discussing climate change. Uh, so what is climate change? So there has been a 1.01 degrees Celsius rise in global temperature since uh, 1850s to 1900s, which is about 150 years ago. And this is due to an influx of greenhouse gases since this industrial revolution. And amongst those greenhouse gases, we have carbon dioxide and methane that comes from burning fossil fuels, cutting down forests, disturbing soil, draining wetlands, and creating landfills. So greenhouse gases act by preventing solar heat from escaping uh, back into space um, and they reflect the heat back to earth. So this increases the temperature of earth and um, with an increase in temperature, there is um, more water vapor and more energy in the atmosphere. And this creates unstable weather patterns. So what have you experienced lately in the Fraser Valley? Have you experienced heavy rainfall events, forest fires, intense heat and drought, increase in problematic insects, floods, windstorms or ice storms, landslides, or stressed or dying trees? So we're gonna throw up a poll now and you can click all that you've experienced or seen in the news for the Fraser Valley. All right, 
So I guess I'll end the poll there. So 95% of you heavy rainfall events, um, intense heat and drought was pretty high. Um, yeah, it kind of covered all of them. All of them are quite high. Um, floods being one of the highest and stress and dying trees as well, uh, we've all seen. Um, yeah, so we've experienced a lot for sure. Uh, I'm gonna close that. So, yeah, and in this, sorry, let me just close that there. Um, yeah, as we all uh, remember from last year, uh, the heat dome that uh, that came into BC um, was a major event, and uh, as well the Sumas flood, um, which Mike touched on. Uh, so these extreme weather events um, are probably going to increase as climate change continues, um, and uh, some other effects as well that are seen globally are rising sea levels, the melting of polar ice caps, an increase in hurricane and tornado activity, and melting of glaciers. Um, so all of, these, all of these effects from climate change also change ecosystems that we love and depend on. So uh, local climate change predictions. So, what are some of the predictions for climate change for uh, the Fraser Valley and for this region? Well, the government of Canada produced a report in 2016 um, called the Canada's Marine Coast in a Changing Climate. And this area seen on the map here in yellow is what is covered in the, their West Coast study region. Um, so the Fraser Valley falls in at the bottom under, the, under this region. Um, and this report can be found at that link there. Um, and our links will be posted um, in the description of the video when we post this to our YouTube channel, so you can access it there as well. Um, and this report touches on temperature, precipitation, hydrology, and river temperature, which I will touch on now. Um, the temperature, in regards to temperature, the average annual temperature has increased about 1.3 degrees Celsius this past century for this region in particular. Um, and is projected to increase um, or to continue to warm with the greatest increase during the summer um, and about 1.4 degrees Celsius by the 2050s and 2.3 degrees Celsius by the 2080s. Um, in terms of precipitation, the atmospheric rivers that we have are expected to increase. And by the 28, by 2080s, um, there is expected to be 10% increase um, of precipitation in all seasons, except summer, which is supposed to be 10% less projected. Um, by the 2050s, winter snowfall is supposed to go down about 25%, and spring snowfall is supposed to go down about 50%. <clears throat> so when there's more, uh, less snow and more rain on the landscape, uh, water runs off much faster because snow isn't holding holding that water for a longer period of time, and this can create water scarcity on the landscape. So in terms of river, river temperature, the Fraser River has actually warmed about 1.5 degrees Celsius since the 1950s, um, and it could actually increase by another 1.9 degrees Celsius by 2100. And this can negatively impact fish populations. Salmon in particular are sensitive to river temperatures at both ends of their life cycle in the uh, spawning and hatchling stages. And it's also likely to impact amphibians, insects, and even the water quality. So by the 2050s, earlier snow melt is projected to advance the timing of the annual peak flow of the Fraser River. So in mission, the, in the peak flow could be 14 to 18 days earlier by the 2050s. So as we see in this map here, this is the projected mid-century change in the April 1st snow water for the Fraser Basin. So um, the amount of uh, water that's coming from snow in the springtime, um, as you can see in red here, is about 50% uh, or more uh, less um, in spring of mid-century whereas the orange is about 25 to 50% um, less 
Um, so drastic decrease in spring snow water um, seen. And that, that has to do with the earlier snow melt, um, as I just mentioned, yeah. So what can we do to help the situation? Um, we can know our landscape, steward our landscape, and protect our landscape to help us move into a healthy climate future. And I will go into all of these aspects now. So knowing your landscape, how do we know our landscape? Um, you can become an investigator and explore. Uh, you can find and interact with your local wetlands and forests, find out what, what are their names? What uh, biodiversity and life do these ecosystems support? How do these natural areas benefit the landscape and the local residents? Um, to find local forests, you could use Google Maps, uh, turn on the satellite imagery, and you can see which clusters of trees are around you and explore to see if that's a forest you can go into or just look at from the outside um, and still get to know it as best you can. Uh, you could also turn on the terrain layers of Google Maps to help you understand the terrain of your area. To find local wetlands, um, some municipalities actually have online mapping systems for the public. For example, Abbotsford has web map, um, as you can see in the upper picture here, um, where I clicked on environment layers and water courses and wetlands to show all the blue that is displayed there. Um, but if you wanted to see just the wetlands separately, you can try IMAP BC as seen as in the picture below. Uh, and there you could find layers. If you click on data sources, then add provincial layers. And wetlands are found under fresh, freshwater atlas, and which is under base maps. And contours are also found under base maps, which will show you the elevation of the area. So let's talk about knowing your landscape. Let's just move this here. Uh, knowing your landscape. Um, to know your landscape, you wanna look for, uh, it, with the maps that we just talked about, you can look for patterns in the forest and terrain and hydrology and see how they overlap and interact with each other. You can explore this by maps or by, uh, you know, driving around or moving or walking around or even biking around your landscape. And, uh, to also help to get to know the landscape, you can help to understand using terrain and hydrology um, if runoff is moving from higher elevations to lower elevations for particular areas, um, or if particular areas are feeding water to other wetlands and streams and aquifers. And you can also look at particular uh, sites or um, green, green areas to see if they serve as a wildlife corridor or if they are more fragmented. So this is an example, this picture here of a fragmented landscape where the, the forests aren't really attached to each other and wildlife can't move in between them. Um, however, a site can serve as a corridor if they act to bridge those gaps. Um, and to also get to know your landscape, you can look into the past. So you can use old photos or you can even use Google Earth Pro, which you could download for free on your computer. And if you click show historical imagery, um, it'll give you a time slider that you can uh, move back and forth to explore imagery from different times. Um, you can go usually about 30 or 40 years in the past. So this is an example here, Eagle Mountain Park. And this is a 1985 image. Um, and this is in Abbotsford around Lower Suamass Mountains. And this image here is the same from 2004. And then we moved to 2007, and this is all with Google Earth Pro. And this is 2021. Um, so you can see a definite development has taken place, um, but this is important to look back and understand your landscape so you can help foster what it used to be and help bring it back to a functional ecosystem. And along with uh, <clears throat> Along with knowing your landscape, <clears throat> um, you can also really dive down into getting to know your yard or your local green spaces um, and not doing this with maps, but doing this in person. Um, in terms of water, you can walk around a, a site, a yard um, during a dry period and feel and see what areas are the driest. Um, you can also uh, walk around during 
and after a period of rain and see where the water flows, um, how does the water pool or infiltrate, and what are the areas where the water flows off of the site. This will all help you inform, um, to be better informed and to help you know, know your sites. Um, and as we move from water to earth, we can look at the soil. So healthy soil is actually a key component in supporting a healthy climate. Um, and we can get to know our soil by looking at its texture, composition, drainage, acidity, and mineral density. And this helps us know also what to plant as well. So there's actually four do-it-yourself soil tests that you can do at home, such as the squeeze test, percolation test, worm test, and pH test. Uh, the squeeze test in particular looks at composition, and this involves taking a handful of moist, not wet soil, giving it a firm squeeze, and then opening your hands. So I'm going to put up a poll in a second, but if you're uh, if you open your hand and it holds its shape but crumbles when lightly poked, do you think it is clay-based, sand-based, or loam-based? Loam being a sand, silt, and clay combination. So we'll put up the poll now and you can give your best guess. Excellent. Okay, I think we're good there. And so yeah, 92% of you said loam. So that is the correct answer. Excellent. Good job. All right, so loam is actually um, soil um, acts to hold moisture and nutrients pretty well um, without being too soggy. So a lot of plants find um, loam to be ideal to plant in, not all plants, of course. Um, uh, however, if you open your hand and it holds its shape um, and stays for formed when poked, it is likely clay, which is nutrient rich um, and slow draining. And so it could be, it could hold uh, moisture um, a little too much sometimes for some plants. Um, and if you open your hand and it falls apart, then it is likely sand-based, which tends to be quick draining and has trouble retaining nutrients and moisture. Um, so other elements we could look at on our site is fire and air. Um, so you can ask yourself, what is the sun exposure and hours of sunlight for a particular site? Um, what is the wind and weather patterns? What are the climate trends? And what are the elevation? So all this can help you uh, understand a site in particular. So as we get to know these ecosystems, we can ask how do they help support a healthy climate? Well, nature is amazing that it provides us with ecosystem services. Um, so ecosystem services are benefits that people obtain from ecosystems. Uh, these benefits can be divided into supporting, regulating, provisioning, um, and cultural benefits, um, and or they can, you know, cross um, different categories and be included in several categories. Um, but climate change benefits generally fall into regulating category, um, and they involve um, climate change mitigation and adaptation benefits. So adaptation. What is adaptation in terms of climate change? So adaptation actions are designed in response to the impacts of climate change that are already occurring or are expected to occur in the future, such as rising sea levels or more intense storms. Um, so basically adaptation is all about coping with climate change. Uh, in terms of mitigation, mitigation is actions that address the root cause of human caused climate change by reducing atmospheric greenhouse gases responsible for climate change, either through emissions reductions or through nature-based solutions. Um, so mitigation is all about preventing uh, climate change from getting worse. Um, and as I just mentioned, nature-based solutions, um, these are ways to work with ecosystems to help mitigate and adapt to climate change. And as you can see in this diagram at the top, it just kind of shows the cycle of climate change, how humans 
contribute to greenhouse gases, <clears throat> which uh, causes climate change and it causes which causes impacts um, on humans. Um, so by implementing some adaptation and mitigation actions, uh, we can help to interrupt this cycle. Diving into mitigation a little more and in terms of nature-based solutions, you can plant and protect trees. So trees are wonderful, wonderful plant or wonderful species uh, that use sunlight to turn water and carbon dioxide into sugar and oxygen. Um, and the carbons in the sugar get stored as plant material. So large trees actually hold a lot of carbon in their roots, their trunks, and uh, their branches and their leaves. Um, so another way to help mitigate climate change would be to protect ecosystems and their soil. Uh, so soil actually holds undecomposed plant matter. Um, as I just said, plant matter holding uh, carbon. Um, so uh, soil itself actually is a great storage for carbon um, and wetlands and peatlands in particular have quite slow decomposition. So they hold a substantial amount of carbon. <clears throat> when it comes to adaptation, uh, forests and wetlands are uh, provide great services of helping us adapt to climate change. For example, forests and wetlands absorb water into the ground and filter it. Um, so during a heavy rainfall event, this is very helpful. Um, instead of letting the water wash down the pavement and top over stream banks. Uh, trees also hold soil onto the ground so that it doesn't get washed away and so that it doesn't contribute to landslides. Um, forests and trees also help us stay cooler during heat events while wetlands provide water during these times of need. Um, wetlands also can provide natural fire breaks from forest fires. And as we move from knowing your landscape, uh, we move into stewarding our environment and our landscape. So uh, as I mentioned, wetlands and forests help us adapt to climate change, but they also need help adapting too. Um, so what is environmental stewardship? It is taking responsibility to promote, monitor, conserve and restore ecosystems for current and future generations of all species. Um, and us at the FEC see environmental stewardship also as environmental awareness leading to environmental action. So in terms of stewarding, uh, how, to how do we bring these natural systems back online with our stewardship actions? And many changes have taken place um, over time as we've, as we've talked about so far. And unfortunately we, fortunately, we have not maintained a connection to the land and its stories. And so it's hard to know what, uh, what the land used to be and how it used to function. Uh, however, indigenous cultures hold these sacred stories and should be regarded as leaders for how we can support the land. As well, we can also look to uh, surrounding natural areas and historical images as guides for what to plant when we're doing stewardship. We can also use photos and imagery to find clues into how the hydrology and forests were functioning and are functioning now. We can ask ourselves what past wetlands or lakes, or sorry, have past wetlands or lakes been drained? Is water being artificially channeled into streams now? And how can your site function better in its role? As we are talking about stewarding, uh, we can look specifically on how to steward for climate adaptation. So um, in order to do this, we must start with assessing the vulnerabilities of our site and the vulnerabilities of our site to climate change effects in particular. So we'll have to ask what could happen in a heavy rainfall or long drought events? Is the site susceptible to fire or pest outbreaks? And how does elevation, a slope, or hydrology influence the site's vulnerabilities. Uh, then we can be informed to choose which kind of approach we wanna take. Do we wanna take a resistance approach or so res resistance actions, which actually improve the defenses of an ecosystem against the anticipated changes or resilience actions, which enhance the ability of systems to bounce back from disturbances. 
Um, and a series of adaptation guides have actually been put out by Northern Institute of Applied Climate Science and USDA Northern Forest Climate Hub, um, which are available at that link there, forestadaptation.org. And these adaptation guides um, are specific to wetlands or specific to forests, and they help us understand how to steward a site to promote um, that site's ability to adapt to climate change, and thus how that ecosystem can help us adapt to climate change as well. And if we get even more specific, and we're talking about our yards in particular, um, so how do we steward our yards? Um, there are many tips to manage yards in, as a way to bring back the natural features and the plants, as a way to mitigate climate change and reduce greenhouse gases, as well as to help us um, and our neighborhood cope with climate change effects and to help nature adapt to climate change too. <clears throat> Some examples in this are installing a rain barrel for watering. Uh, you could also use ground cover in such as moss or clover instead of grass. Um, you can create a compost um, or you can plant a rain garden where the water naturally pools. And this will be informed as you get to know your site and your yard. Um, and as we get to know our site and the types of soil um, that's present and the amount of light that's present, um, you can refer to our gardening with native plants guide, which you can download from our website. Um, and uh, this actually is great, a great way to um, know what native plants are ideal for specific, um, our specific soils and our specific uh, specific light conditions, and it also helps us know how to create great habitat for the wildlife around us. And then let's move from stewarding to protecting our landscape. So what can we do to prevent ecosystems from being developed over? <clears throat> so first off, it's important to remain aware of local development projects um, and policies that are taking place and voicing our opinions on these. Um, some municipalities have platforms that they post these um, projects on that are up for public uh, consultation. So the city of Abbotsford has let's talk abbotsford.ca. Um, currently the development by, uh, bylaw update is up, up there. Um, and you can refer to um, these other municipalities and their uh, engagement platforms, um, or you can contact your municipality and see if they have such a platform in place. Um, but some municipalities just post these um, um, opportunities on their websites. Um, they may also give letters to local citizens that might be impacted by a project. Um, they could post in local papers, put signage at a site um, or post on their social media. Um, as well, um, in addition to this, it's important to let your city councillors know that you care about the natural environment. Um, and this goes a long way into creating change and to making us, to help us move into a healthy climate future. So as we've touched on knowing our landscape, stewarding our landscape and protecting our landscape, I'm curious to know how you would like to steward your landscape to support a healthy climate. So out of what I spoke about, kind of what calls to you? Um, is it explore local wetlands and forests, examine maps of your area, enhance natural areas so that they work with the greater landscape again, discover the water and soil characteristics of your site, plant trees to reduce greenhouse gases, uh, express uh, to your city councillors the importance of natural areas, or give your opinion on development projects and policies. Uh, so we're going to put up that poll now. You can click all that apply, even if it's all of them, or only if it's just one, click any that that call to you.
give it just a couple more seconds. I see some of you are still reading the <laughs> yeah <laughs> the long the, the long pool. <laughs> yeah. Okay, just about to close it now. All right. Excellent. So, um, do I scroll? No. Um, so yeah, I guess the winners at 86% are explore local wetlands and forests. Yeah, definitely a fun way to help to get to know our landscape and plant trees to reduce greenhouse gases. Yes, very important. And then everyone was kind of also um, interested in the other opportunities. Thank you for participating in that. What's that? So yes, we can definitely do it, um, starting by knowing our landscape, protecting our landscape, and then stewarding our landscape. And here are some references that I used throughout as the numbers correspond to the points they were from. And these can be referred to when we post this video as well. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Uh, now we're going to open the floor for question and answer period. So this is your opportunity. You have Mike Pearson and Laura here, Laura Brody, at your beck and call for whatever questions you might have regarding their presentations or anything else related to what they do. Feel free to pop them into the chat and we can get some questions and answers going. So I'll patiently await your questions in the chat. Uh, first up, we have something from Aaron here. Aaron says, uh, this is um, something for us all to know. You can view historic air photos on Google Earth. Uh, you need to add the layer and click through to access images, but they're there with fairly decent resolution. The link is searchable on the BC Data Catalog. Thank you very much for that. Excellent, thank you. All right, for those of you who aren't posting questions and would maybe rather um, just use their microphone, are you interested in asking a question using your mic? If so, now's your chance. You can talk to Laura or Mike. We have a message from Hilda that says trees are quickly being cut in my neighborhood. Uh, that's really sad to hear, Hilda. Um, could you give us a little more information about where you are? Maybe we can speak to what opportunities are available in that neighborhood in particular. Uh, Travis says, um, shouldn't we oppose all proposed development projects? Would the cities listen to us if we did? Are there good places or projects? It's an interesting question, Travis. Who'd like to pick up that question about proposing develop or opposing development projects? I can say a couple words. Um, I don't think we opposing all development projects is very realistic because the population continues to grow and people are going to go somewhere, but we can control where it goes. And we have not come nearly close to what is the potential for infilling in areas that are already developed rather than so. So yes, development for sure. I would say in general, oppose greenfield development in natural areas and advocate for development in areas that are, that are already disturbed and developed. For sure, yeah. My two sets. I think that's good. And uh, keeping in mind that there are uh, amazing solutions in terms of urban planning um, that, I mean, if we studied urban planning, then we would know more about this or as, a, as someone who does study urban planning, not myself, but someone who does would probably have uh, really great solutions and ideas for how to have a le the least amount of impact on the environment um, and also make cities very livable for people um, so that uh, they also have less of an impact on climate change. Um, there's ways to uh, design cities that um, are much more capable of um, 
being able to have less of an impact. So commuting distance would be taken into effect. And um, uh, yeah, there's different aspects of greenhouse gases that can be integrated into urban planning that would also be a direction to move towards in terms of uh, development projects. One thing that I would add was that um, the other place to, of course, avoid and to move out of is the floodplains close to the rivers, particularly the Fraser. Um, now, this is difficult because it, a lot of the land is developed and worth a lot, but as time goes on and flood events become more severe and more frequent, um, it's will in the long run save us a great deal of grief and money to uh, to give the river to give the river room to move and to flood because rivers rivers move move naturally right they meander naturally for sure excellent thanks uh, we have a message from Dale what stage is the Katzi Marsh at a proposal or underway a pipe dream at the moment. <laughs> um, it is one that it is a, one of the sites that we are looking at through the Resilient Waters Program. Um, sort of when our first years and spent looking at all these sites and prioritizing which ones we think are sort of the the priority areas to be doing restoration. And, and Casey Marsh is one we have identified. There is zero political buy-in at this point. Um, but you can all help change that. So um, we are advocating for it and getting and talking to the, the right people, the decision makers about it. Um, but it's, it, uh, it's just, just an idea at this point. All right, so... Um... Hilda, who was speaking about trees being cut in her neighborhood, is uh, now saying that uh, there are lots being sold with a lot of development potential, numerous birds and wildlife leaving um, owls, for example. What can be done to conserve large heritage trees in the neighborhood? Um, Hilda, this is really a depends which municipality you live in type question um, when it comes to trees and uh, what types of bylaws are in place. Um, we'd still need a little bit more information, but I think we could get some, some general conversation going around uh, what habitat protection looks like on the landscape, if um, you're interested in having that conversation, the two of you. Yeah, you're right. The municipalities who um, sort of control a lot, of, much of the development um, things. There are provincial approvals required in some cases, um, particularly if there's a waterway involved. That's the case where you are. Um, but uh, so, but local action is probably the most effective in in a lot of cases. Um, so find out if you have a tree protection for being enforced. And um, if not, then, then probably a good idea to advocate to get one. There are uh, model bylaws. If you Google the uh, Green Bylaws Toolkit, the uh, University of Victoria um, Center for Law there is um, developed sort of basically templates for a whole bunch of uh, green bylaws, including tree bylaws, that that, uh, that municipalities can adopt or adapt as as required. Yeah, that's great. Great, great idea. Erin is going to be writing letters of support for rewatering Katzi, Mike. So just so you know, you've got at least <laughs> some support coming your way. Um, Jacqueline's Excellent. asking if we yet understand the damage done to estuaries by the flooding last year. If we, I did not hear all of that, and damage done to? To estuaries by the flooding. Um, 
not sure, probably less damage to the estuaries and further up river because the river is much wider there. It can take sort of more volume. There was li very little damage to the Fraser River itself, right? Um, because in November, although the floods were, you know, the amount of rainfall and the amount of runoff was unprecedented, the main river takes that much water every year during flushing, right? It, that was incredible. And up here, the, and at one point during the November floods, the river was slightly higher than it was at peak freshet in June in 2021, uh, which it, you know, is unheard of for that time of year. But the river itself, the main stem, um, can certainly handle those flows. It's all the tributaries, right? That, and that's where we saw the, the flooding coming from the um, south large part due to an overflowing nooksack in the further south, but even further up river and again, all those pictures in the Coca Hall and stuff, those are all the, the tributaries that got really hit because they are not built to handle that amount of, of flow or not equipped to. It probably would have been, you know, more sediment, a big, a bit of a slug of sediment coming down into it. And again, I, I'm not too worried about the estuary itself. Great, thanks. Um, our next question is, what are the biggest contributions to CO2 in the atmosphere in the Fraser Valley? Uh, Marion is assuming that transportation and home heating might be some of the biggest contributors, but uh, Laura, do you have any answers for this question? And the Fraser Valley specifically, um, I mean, I, I haven't researched this myself, um, but yes, I would say transportation is probably, I mean, uh, in terms of commuting, some people are commuting uh, long distances. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of development, um, as the population is increasing and there's more development, um, you also, you know, you're removing trees often and, uh, excuse me, <laughs> and um, this takes the, the carbon dioxide that um, they've sequestered and um, sometimes releasing it, sometimes storing it, um, however, the trees are being used, um, but also the soil that's being disturbed. Um, is no longer sometimes capable of containing that um, undecomposed plant matter anymore and exposing it to air and churning it, it, uh, it up sometimes will often release that carbon back out um, into the atmosphere um, and no longer can that soil serve as a way to um, sequester carbon. Um, so I would say, yeah, development uh, projects can can definitely exacerbate um, greenhouse gases being released. Um, yeah, I'd say those are probably some of the main factors. Um, yeah, and there's uh, there's ways to you know do uh, agriculture and farming and that in more uh, sustainable ways and. Um, these are great um, avenues being explored too in the Fraser Valley. Great, thanks. Um, thanks for getting your questions in everybody. This is going very well. Uh, Travis is asking now, do you think Sumas Lake will return due to increased rainfall predicted? Should the government buy out homeowners and businesses there now and allow the lake to return? I think that's a question a lot of people have lately. It is, and it's a complicated question. Um, and it's probably not um, a yes or no, in that my, my suspicion, as I said, in the long term, is that all or part of the lake will be back. Um, now, certainly, I think there's, it may, and I don't know how it will go, and probably depends on the frequency of flood events and the political winds and all of that, but rather than sort of a decision to flood the lake, something that I would expect to 
maybe see in the interim would be a floodway along the Sumas River where they maybe a buyout through there of getting, it's not that this land couldn't be farmed at all, I mean, uh, along the river, um, but if we get the, um, at least in an interim, if we pulled the buildings and the animals and all of that out there, built a wide floodway that would take more of the water, that might be an interim solution. But it is, it's uh, big and complicated and expensive to do. So I don't think anyone would have understands exactly yet how it would happen, but I think it's gonna to have to be dealt with as, as pointed out. I mean, the, the sea level is gonna rise inevitably and the, all the modeling and all the experts are telling us that, that um, these types of storm events are gonna get larger and more frequent. So, yeah. But I, 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 I won't, uh, I don't have a crystal ball to say how it's, how or when it's gonna happen. That's why we brought you here, Mike. <laughs> Where is your crystal <laughs> ball? I think we have time for one more question and it's from Sylvia. And Sylvia's talking about, um, we used to have uh, land clearance around waterways uh, with, 50 foot buffers, but it has been reduced to 30 foot buffers. Do you think we can enforce going back to 50 feet or more? And this sounds like we're talking about riparian areas around water courses and those areas being protected, those trees being protected. Yeah, well, there's, it's a little more complicated than this. There are different rules depending on land use, whether it's being developed, whether it's agriculture, whether it's whether it's forestry. So right now in development land, which is probably what most people are thinking about, the province in the Fraser Valley goes with a, um, a riparian area regulation. And that um, the width that's required depends on the nature of the stream, whether or not it has fish, how wide it is, whether it's um, got a, a lot of southern exposure and a more vulnerable that way, whether it's in a ravine or not. And that's, although all of those things are appropriate, I don't really have a, the, um, the intent or the, the, uh, the way the, it's, it's laid out the way it has been implemented has been abysmal. Um, there, you know, there, it's, and that gets into a, you know, a larger can of worms too, in terms of the role of consultants and who's paying them um, and all of that kind of thing. But uh, because they're, you know, and there's not really, I think a lot of oversight or enough oversight on those things. So there, it's pretty clear, I think, that the riparian areas are not being protected to the degree that that law intended them to uh, being implemented. So it's a matter of, in some cases, of resources for the agencies, and in some cases of sort of policies of what gets um, enforced and where charges are laid. In cases of Fisheries Act, for example, that where things do go sideways. So it's, yeah, these, our riparian areas are very poor to protect. Um, on farmland, most people don't know there is no protection. Right? If you're on, if they're on the ALR, there is, is no, or for farm use, there is no requirement for a riparian setback at all. Thanks, Mike. Uh, complicated answer to a complicated question. There is no easy way about uh, getting more buffer on riparian areas, that's for sure. But we're just about at the end of our time here. So I am going to take us through a wrap up now. So I am going to take screen sharing away from Laura. Sorry, Laura, now it's me. There we go. 
All right, so now it's time for our wrap up. And since we're at Nature Stewardship School and we're all about environmental awareness leading to action, I think it is important that we have a good sense of what it is we learned today so that we can take our next steps. So we started off with Mike, who was talking about the Fraser Valley's landscape and our current management situations, especially when it comes to our Fraser River watershed. And what did we learn? Uh, how did the Fraser Valley come to be? Really, it was through thousands of years of gradual change with the glaciation and stewardship by First Nations that we've really had this productive and beautiful Fraser Valley ecosystem. And these unique river reaches were formed that each support wide ranges of biodiversity in their own way. What has changed? There have been extreme modifications to the Fraser River watershed in the past 200 years, especially here in the Fraser Valley. And the cumulative habitat issues are resulting in extreme negative impacts to our biodiversity, especially for salmon. And Mike told us that rearing habitat throughout the Fraser River floodplain has been degraded. So it's not just particular areas, but it's the entire connectivity of that floodplain that has these cumulative impacts on our local species, especially salmon. And what can be learned from recent catastrophic events? Well, we need to work towards smarter and more sustainable water management. For example, Mike was just suggesting having wider floodways as one way that instead of having these constricted and uh, <laughs> potentially impacted dam and dike and drainage systems, we can have more responsible water management systems. And also that restoration is possible, but action is needed. So action on the ground, but also action in the office. Uh, political will is one of the things that's keeping some of these actions from being implemented on the ground. Then we move from kind of past to present into the future with Laura's presentation. And Laura was building awareness of climate stewardship actions, starting with projections for the future of the Fraser Valley with climate change. And Laura's talk really showed us that extreme weather events and destabilization of ecosystems is in the forecast. And uh, this is something that we can try to deny, but it's happening. We've all seen things that are going on more frequently lately. And while we can try our best to stop things now, these things are coming and they are happening now. So how can we help the Fraser Valley in this changing climate? Uh, Laura was speaking about adaptation, which is really how healthy ecosystems help us cope with these changes that are coming, and mitigation, which is about reducing greenhouse gases and climate change impacts. And when we're doing these things, we want to undertake stewardship in a responsible way. And we start with understanding the past, learning about where we live. No steward protect was the range that Laura gave us to work with here. Uh, respecting the wisdom, knowledge, involvement, and rights of First Nations. Uh, this is critical for when we're undertaking environmental stewardship actions anywhere, but here in the Fraser Valley, we really need to work with our First Nations who have been stewarding this land for time immemorial and take reconciliation seriously. We need to plan for connected and resilient ecosystems. Uh, this is true when we're thinking about planning for the future of climate change, and it's true for planning about dealing with things now. We have these salmon, we have these uh, species at risk across the landscape that need connectivity, they need resiliency, so that's something that we need to work towards. Also, we can't forget Protecting remaining habitats will not only help us reduce climate change severity and impacts, but will help to keep the biodiversity that we have here intact for future generations. 
So if you're ready to begin, the future of the Fraser Valley starts right now. You can show your support for responsible watershed management initiatives like the Resilient Waters work that Mike is part of. You can learn more about nature-based solutions to climate change. A lot of you were interested in getting to know about your neighborhood and planting trees. So our close to home program here at the Fraser Valley has information for you there. You can become a nature steward. Our nature steward program is for landowners who want to learn how to better steward their properties for nature. This is a free program where we provide information about your property and what you can do. And you receive a lovely plaque that you can display to show the neighborhood that this is something that you're seriously invested in. You can join our volunteer program at the Fraser Valley Conservancy. We have a lot of great work that takes place on the ground that is dedicated to helping our ecosystems and species at risk in the face of climate change. So that's certainly a place to start. Our spring native plant sale is coming soon. So save the date, pick up May 14th. Our online store opens early April. So if you're looking for a source for native plants, you don't wanna miss our spring native plant sale. You can sign up for future nature stewardship school webinars. We're going to have a lot more information for you coming down the pipe. And this is a sneak peek for Agassiz residents. There's a new community-based climate change program coming your way that's going to be led by Laura. So if you wanna learn more, you're gonna to have to send her an email. And finally, I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for attending. Special thanks to Mike and Pearson Ecological for helping us out with this Nature Stewardship School today. Please fill out the survey that we'll be sending to you. It's how you can have your say on how we continue the Nature Stewardship School series. And don't forget to check out our website for information and resources. Join us on social media. And we hope to see you again next time at Nature Stewardship School. Thank you so much for coming. Have a great night, everybody. Bye-bye.